into Indian comparative literature today because we have, I mean, uh, we are doing it from a different perspective today. So, you know, in people would generally put uh, the beginning of comparative literature, they would peg it to 1827 when Goethe, uh, the German writer, the famous German writer, he spoke about wealth literature or world literature. But I want to point out something uh, very interesting that happened uh, a few uh, uh, few decades earlier. In 1785, something happened in India. You know, uh, a person, uh, Charles Wilkins, he translated the Bhagavad Gita, the holy text, the holy scripture, uh, the Bhagavad Gita into English in 1785. And he requested uh, you know, the first governor general of India, Warren Hastings, to, you know, uh, to write a foreword to his translation. In this foreword, what Warren Hastings does is very something that interests us. He says he pleads for a comparative study of Gita, Bhagavad Gita on the one hand, and the European works of great merit. His idea was this, I'm, I'm not going into quotations. He said something like this. He said, you know, uh, the, in India, we have the Mahabharata. And the Mahabharata is being translated into English. And Warren Hastings says, I have great regard for the masterpieces of Western literature, say the Iliad or the Odyssey. And I have great reverence, I venerate uh, John Milton uh, for his Paradise Lost, but I also feel that we should study the translations of Mahaparada along with our Milton and our Virgil and our Homer. Of course, he is not speaking about comparative literature, but isn't he thinking about literature beyond boundaries, literature beyond borders? See, across cultural uh, you know, exchange is happening. Uh, literature from India being compared to ancient literature from, you know, Greece, juxtaposing, placing side by side uh, with uh, Milton. So there are grains of comparative literature in what he said. Now, now let us come back to what Goethe said in 1827. Goethe spoke of wealth literature world literature. It is translated, it can be translated as world literature. And it is considered to be the beginning of comparative literature, Gede's proposition of wealth literature. And what does this proposition mean? When Gede spoke about wealth literature or world literature, it indicated the availability or circulation of literary texts from different nations, different cultures, different languages to other parts of the world. So, uh, you know, if you want a world literature, you need literary text being produced in other parts of the world. You need it, you, you want to get it, and you should be able to read it. Uh, so probably Gethe also had in mind the idea of translation, because only when we get to translate, uh, we will be uh, able to understand, uh, you know, uh, a foreign tongue. So. Aesthetically, Goethe's, Goethe's formulation signals the recognition of literary features of universal significance, universal values. This is very important in comparative literature. So when you speak about world literature, what is it? It says that you can find comparisons between uh, similarities between literatures li written in different parts of the world. In other words, there are universals. Okay. And the conception of wealth literature or world literature can be uh, considered to be in contrast or opposed to the concept of national literature. Yet they didn't speak about national literature. He spoke about world literature. He was asking his fellow Germans and maybe uh, fellow Europeans too to read other literatures, literatures produced in other countries. And 
definitely he had an interest in translation. I would quote just one sentence from Gete. He says, uh, you know, uh, Gete has this to say, it is becoming more and more obvious to me that poetry is the common property of all mankind, signaling universal values. And then in 1848, Matthew Arnold, you are familiar with Matthew Arnold, and he has got something to do with comparative literature. I'm sure you might have noticed when he spoke about touchstone method, there is something, uh, e some eerie connection with comparative literature, or, uh, or when he defined criticism, the function of criticism and the present time there he defines criticism as a disinterested endeavor to learn and propagate the best that is known and known and thought the best that is known and thought in the world so this man matthew arnold always had this idea of world world literature global citizen and matthew arnold uh, you know he was a teacher and a preacher so 1848 uh, you know he was giving the inaugural lecture as professor of poetry at Oxford, baptized comparative literature. In other words, uh, merited with coining the English word comparative literature. And he says, everywhere there is connection, everywhere there is illustration, connections, illustrations. No single event, no single comprehended, except in its relation to other events, to other literatures. To understand a literature, you have other literatures, Arnold says. And he continues, we must compare. What is the purpose? The works of other ages with those of our own age and country. For what? To know how we stand that we may know. I mean, to know how others stand so that we may know how we ourselves stand. In other words, to judge ourselves we have to first know what others are doing. We have to first know others. So Arnold spoke about comparative literature. And the term comparative literature was coined by Matthew Arnold in 1848. 1827, Goethe, Welt Literature. 1848, Matthew Arnold, the English term comparative literature. And soon, uh, you know, uh, this idea of comparative literature spread throughout the globe. and three major schools of comparative literature emerged. Three major schools. Uh, the, the French school of comparative literature, the German school of comparative literature, and comparative literature. First, the French school. See, when you look at the French school, comparative literature as an academic discipline of a cross-disciplinary character, uh, where is the tragedy? When we trace the history of comparative literature, what we find instead is a history of violent debate. There were arguments for and against comparative literature. What is the problem? What is the problem? In 1903, Benedicto Croce argued that comparative literature was a non subject, non, N O N, not K N O W N. He said that comparative literature was a non, N-O-N, non-subject. What is he saying? He contemptuously dismissed the idea that comparative literature is a discipline in its own right, questioning the very identity of comparative literature. He argued that there is no study more arid than researches of this sort, more arid, very dry, very boring. He said that comparative literature is utterly boring. Terrible. And he suggested that the proper object of study, instead of comparison, it should be, we, we should be thinking about literary history. He argued the term, that the term comparative literature had no substance to it. Ah, oh, very bad. No, he, he was saying uh, it did not exist. It is uh, obfuscatory. Uh, it doesn't mean anything. And then he says it had no substance to it. You know, Lane Cooper, another critic, he says, comparative literature is a bogus term, a fake term that makes neither sense nor syntax. 
what he was saying was any per person with some sense would not do comparative studies. So there excuse were a lot of problems. Let me excuse sir. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, sir, is the network properly working, sir? Because we have some clicks over here. Yeah, it is working. I guess it is, yeah. Because uh, here we do not get the audio, sir. So can you just uh, switch off your microphone and just switch it on, sir? Yeah, sure. Is it fine? Um, give me a second, sir. Give me a second, sir. Yeah, sure. I think we can continue. People say now it is clear. Okay, sh shall I continue? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I was saying about two people, two critics who spoke vociferously against comparative literature. Benedicto Croce, who said that comparative literature is a non-subject uh, that it is very dry and that it had no substance to it. And Lane Cooper, who described comparative literature as senseless and syntaxless and as a bogus term. There were many critics in this group who argued against comparative literature. On the other hand, many scholars made very grand claims for comparative literature. Charles Mills Gailey, for example, uh, in the same 1903, that Benedito Croce said that it was a useless thing. Uh, Charles Mills gaily said that the working premise of the student of comparative literature was a common institutional expression of humanity. A common institutional expression of humanity. What a, what a great way of defining something. And in India in 1907, Rabindranath Tagore spoke about Bishwa Sahitya, world literature, very similar to what uh, Gete said in 1827, wealth literature. Uh, Tagore says about Bishwa Sahitya, world literature. He contrasts it with Gramya Sahitya, Gramya versus Vishwa, law, uh, national literature versus world literature. So people like Rabindranath Tagore, were supporting comparative literature, while some others were saying very bad things about comparative literature. Strong arguments for and against comparative literature. Anyway, so the growth of comparative literature got a little stunted now. Slowly, comparative literature consolidated its position as an academic discipline. Thanks to something that happened in an altogether different sphere in politics. What happened? There was the World War, 1914 to 1918. There was the first World War and the US President Woodrow Wilson came up with the vision of one world. One world. You know, one world, one literature, world literature. Yeah. So it was... Uh, this, this vision of one world propounded by Woodrow Wilson helped comparative literature a great deal to establish itself as an academic discipline because uh, it, it was something like this one world vision that comparative literature also proposed, world literature. You know, when we, uh, when we look at uh, the history of human civilization, we find that such idealistic visions recur whenever there is a major international crisis. For example, we are right now we are in an international crisis, the global pandemic, and that has brought us all together. See, had there been no corona, had there been no pandemic, we would never have been together today. Uh, what brought us together? a pandemic, a, an international crisis. So what I'm saying is whenever there is an international crisis, in the aftermath of the crisis, we will find idealistic visions of unity and oneness, like the one world theory propounded by Woodrow Wilson. Or think about what happened after the second world war. People didn't want a third world war. They saw all the troubles and all the misery of the wars, two world wars, and they wanted no more war. So the countries of the world strongly vouched for a United Nations Assembly. One world by Woodrow Wilson, United Nations Assembly. 
in politics. This happened in politics. And at the same time, something happened in comparative literature as well. You know, when people were speaking about United Nations Assembly in comparative literature, you know, two people, Rene Wellek and Austin Warren, in 1949, they came up with a monumental treatise titled Theory of Literature. A very great uh, work in the history of uh, English literature. So in that book, Rene Wellek and Austin Warren, they actually offered a cultural or literary equivalent to United Nations Assembly. In politics, there was this United Nations Assembly. In culture, Rene Wellek and Austin Warren suggested that we have comparative literature. And this comparative literature can be seen as a cultural equivalent to the United Nations Assembly. What great way of uh, you know, proposing comparative literature as a great thing. They depicted, Rene Wellek and Austin Warren, they depicted the comparatist as a, a comparison as a vocation and the comparatist as a kind of United Nations ambassador for comparative literature. They said that literature and humanity are one, just, I mean, literature is one just as art and humanity are one. And they spoke about both a widening of perspectives and a suppression of local and provincial sentiments. Rene Wellek and Austin Warren suggesting comparative literature as the cultural equivalent of the United Nations Assembly. What great credit to comparative literature. And then Francois Jost, he said something even more interesting. He said, that we should see comparative literature as some kind of world religion. This is what he says, I will quote. Uh, Francois Jo says this, uh, comparative literature represents more than an academic discipline. It's not just an academic discipline, but much more than that. He says that it is an overall view of literature, of the world of lectures, a humanistic ecology, and a, a literary Weltanschauung, a literary worldview, a vision of the cultural universe, inclusive and comprehensive, suggesting comparative literature as a kind of world religion. And the underlying suggestion here is that all cultural differences will disappear when a reader takes up great works of art. Here art is seen as an instrument, as a vehicle of universal peace and harmony. And the comparatist is envisaged as one who facilitates that harmony. So what a great profession comparative literature comparison turned out to be in, in the words of these people. And in 1954, you know, I was speaking about Pound as a comparatist. Uh, in 1954, uh, uh, we, we see, we witness the founding of the ICLA, International Comparative Literature Association at Oxford University. Institutionalization of comparative literature, right? So, and Estra Pound was one of the founding fathers of ICLA, 1954. So suddenly everything is uh, again starting to look very rosy for comparative literature and it seemed like comparative literature had to just be there and uh, it will grow into one of the greatest disciplines ever. But no, but no, unfortunately, no. Trouble was brewing for comparative literature. In, by the 1960s, people started speaking about the crisis of comparative literature. And there are two Renés, René Vellick, Rene Vellek and Austin Warren I was describing just a while back. So Rene Vellek and Rene Etienne, two critics who especially spoke about the crisis in comparative literature. So what was this crisis that they were talking about? The problem was there was a lot of theorizing, but nobody was actually doing any comparison. Harry Levin uh, sums up this crisis in, in these words. 
we spend uh, and quoting we spend far too much of our energy talking about comparative literature and not enough of it comparing the literature lot of practical work i mean lot of theoretical work but no practical action he was exhorting the comparatists to stop theorizing and do some practical work this was the crisis okay so this is a tragedy right this is the tragedy of the life and death of comparative literature and in shakespeare's tragedies we find interludes comic uh, interludes i will have a short interlude as well something that i want to connect with this lecture but i want to briefly uh, invite your attention to a particular movement that flourished in the 1950s the beat movement i am sure you are familiar with the beat generation of the 1950s it originally began as an underground anti conformist youth movement in the us we are familiar with uh, some of the greatest works in uh, beat movement allen jim's works howl jack uh, kerr works on the road howl was published in 1956 on the road was published in 1957 and you know the central element of beat culture was a rejection of existing narratives it was a counter narrative it was it rejected existing values and something else was born out of this beat movement hippism the hippie culture you know hippism right uh, hippism was you know it was a counter cultural movement that uh, took inspiration from uh, the beat movement obviously uh, it originated in the 1960s it flourished in the 1970 70s and it uh, died in the 1980s i guess so the uh, the movement called hippism allen ginsberg's works were central to the hippie culture so what was the central tenets of hippism they questioned everything they rebelled against everything they rebelled against established institutions they criticized middle class bourgeois values they opposed the war they opposed you know the, they were against uh, america's uh, you know war in in vietnam they were against that and they had some great things to say as well they said that uh, breastfeeding should be promoted at a time when mothers were uh, you know moving away from that so they had something great but normally there is a tendency to look at hippism as a very bad uh, movement they were uh, they had a lot of things to do with drug abuse and sex and things like that so we generally consider it as a bad movement but what i want to say is something else they were rebellious against institutions values orthodoxy uh, they 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 considered peace love and personal freedom they were very uh adamant that we want our freedom and they saw the system as something that constrict uh, that suppressed their freedom they perceived the dominant culture as a corrupt monolithic entity that ex that exercised undue power over their lives and the hippie culture spread throughout the world through you know rock folk uh, psychedelic rock the music you know the blues now what i want to tell you is this hippie culture that that came to prominence in the 1960s hippism comprised mostly of teenagers and young adults between the age of 15 and 25 young people 15 to 25 and throughout the hippie movement many hippie students were threatened of expulsion from universities many hippie students were dismissed you know suspended and later dismissed from colleges and universities for openly expressing their views now we find a lot of students out of the university right now i want you know, to take you back to our history of comparative literature in the 1960s what happened was high flying graduate students in the 1950s and 60s high flying graduate students in the west uh, 
turn to comparative literature as a radical subject because they found that comparative literature embodied the very values that they wanted trans it was transgressive it was radical it crossed all boundaries they wanted to jump out of the boundaries of existing systems and comparative literature was doing just that it was crossing all boundaries it was transgressive moving across the boundaries of single literature study so these students these youngsters they embraced comparative literature most fondly in the 50s and 60s they were not worried that there was no proper methodology for comparative literature they they were not worried about what the critics said about comparative literature whether the subject were existed or not they were not worried about any of those things they loved comparative literature and so for the first time comparative literature was having an extraordinary time in the academy it became a pakka comparative pakka academic subject but you know comparative literature was ill fated the fault in the stars maybe what happened just when comparative literature seemed to be making giant strides flaws in the idea of universal values and of world literature were being explored in all parts of the world what am i saying the idea of universal values you know we moved great waves of critical thought from structuralism uh, to post structuralism and deconstruction swept through one after the other and what happened earlier we believed that there was meaning and uh, a, a text has a meaning and a competent reader a sahridaya uh, can reach that meaning if he is, if he does something in, in a certain way so the author is the creator of the meaning uh, there is an a fixed meaning in in the text and the reader can get that meaning if he is competent enough this was the traditional belief but with deconstruction and post structuralism with these movements what happened was the idea that we can have a single harmonious reading this idea was shattered forever and question of the question you know the idea of universals started being questioned people qu started questioning the idea of universals universal values and if there are no universals you know comparative literature is in deep trouble so this is what happened so these theories came and comparative literature was overshadowed the very foundational principles of comparative literature were proved wrong by these theories and what happened 1967 you know what happened uh, derrida presented structure sign and play in the discourse of the human sciences uh, he published three books one after the other uh, translated famously by gayatri chakravarti spivak and with all these what happened was we reached a world of literary theory and just a while before we were talking about how students thronged the universities to study comparative literature as a radical subject but now students realize that no comparative literature is not that radical these theories are radical so by the 1970s a new generation of high flying graduate students in the west had turned to literary theory women studies cultural studies as radical subject choices abandoning comparative literature they abandoned comparative literature bye bye goodbye goodbye to, they bade goodbye to comparative literature and they embraced literary theory so comparative literature lost its uh, place in the academy to literary theory and you know what happened in 1993 a very famous comparative susan bassnet you know when we speak about comparative literature we cannot uh, explain it without recourse to susan bassnet uh, she's a very famous comparatist so in 1993 susan bassnet published comparative literature a critical introduction 
just think about it uh, we started discussing comparative literature since 1820s and even after 170 years what is the title of this book by susan basnet comparative literature a critical introduction oh my god still taking baby steps comparative literature so uh, in this book i mean susan basnet published this book and comparative literature was very hopeful. Okay, finally, Susan Bassnett will defend me. This is what comparative literature probably expected from uh, Susan Bassnett, but Susan Bassnett had something else to say. She wanted to discuss the troublesome relationship between comparative literation, literature and translation studies. You know what? While comparative literature was losing ground in the West, Translations, tra translation studies was uh, gaining in uh, popularity and strength. We know that comparative literature and translation studies are closely related. You know, uh, comparison requires a lot of translation. Without translation, we cannot read foreign productions. So we, we, we know the connection between comparative literature and translation studies. And generally, it was believed that comparative literature was the major discipline, uh, the, the bigger discipline, and uh, translation studies was considered as a subcategory to comparative literature. But Susan Bassnett said that this assumption was had, will have to be questioned. Susan Bassnett pointed out that we needed to reassess the relationship between comparative literature and translation studies. What is the problem? Why should we reassess? See, if comparative literature is the main discipline and if translation studies is the sub-discipline, but that was not how things was happening. Translation studies had developed to such an extent that there were many in the 1990s, there were many who considered translation studies as a complete, full-fledged discipline in its own right. And it was very interdisciplinary. It derived from works in linguistics, literary study, history, anthropology, uh, psychology, sociology, very interdisciplinary, intercultural. It had a sound scope. It, has a, it had a clear methodology. It had clear meaning. It had a clear purpose. And comparative literature had none of these things. It didn't have a proper methodology. Its scope was being questioned. Its meaning was being questioned. Yes, it was intercultural, but it was unable, still making baby steps. And so, seen from this angle propounded by Susan Bassnett, comparative literature began to appear less and less like a discipline and more and more like a subcategory, a branch of something else. You know, this had happened earlier also in the relationship between semiotics and linguistics. We know what semiotics is. It is the study of science and linguistics is the st scientific study of language. You know, there was a time when people thought that linguistics uh, was the bigger category and semiotics was considered a subcategory to linguistics. But later it became very clear that it was not the case that, and, and, and people, and it became very clear that linguistics was a sub-discipline of semiotics. The same happened to comparative literature with Susan Bassnett. With Susan Bassnett's, this publication of this uh, book, Comparative Literature in 1993, comparative literature began to be seen increasingly as a subcategory of translation studies. Poor comparative literature. It lost its pride of place to translation studies. It was abandoned by the students, rejected, dejected, battered, bruised, torn, worn out, helpless. And then, Somebody had to just give the death certificate. And Gayatri Chakravarti Spivok did that in 2003. She published uh, Death of a Discipline. I was alluding to that at the beginning of my lecture. So in the book, Death of a Discipline, Spivok uh, 
declares the death of comparative literature as we know it. And she called for a new comparative literature. She called it, she named it, it's very interesting. She named the new comparative literature that she envisaged as comparative cultural studies. What is happening? Comparative literature died and cultural studies, comparative cultural studies. Gayatri Spivok spoke about that. So I would say comparative literature died. When somebody died, what would we do? Well, we have to do a post-mortem. If it is a drama, if it is a play, if it is a tragedy, uh, at the end of the play, we would uh, start thinking about how much here. What was it that led to the fall of the hero, the, uh, the you know, uh, the death of the hero. Uh, we speak about uh, procrastination of Hamlet. We speak about sexual jealousy in Othello. All these things we know. Harmarsia. Here, should we, shouldn't we discuss about the harmarsia, uh, you know, of comparative literature? Or I would, I know it is 12, uh, but uh, the organizers have given me half an hour too. Uh, I, they have given me a free hand as well. They, have told me that I can speak as long as uh, there, are, there is somebody to listen, <laughs> definitely. So I will continue. So what I would like to do is to do a short post-mortem of comparative literature. What are the reasons for the untimely deaths of comparative literature? Reason number one, lack of actual practice. I explained it earlier, what Harry Levin said, comparative literature only paid lip service to what Goethe said. They never practiced what they preached. In 1990, Earl Miner asserted that actual comparison is scarcely found in the work of comparatists. And even he says that, com I'm quoting, comparatists do not talk about comparison. Just imagine. So there was no actual practice of comparison happening. This is one reason for the death of comparative literature. Second, second, my second point is lack of a proper definition of its scope. Scope of comparative literature. As we know, comparative literature shared space with many other disciplines. It, it is very interdisciplinary. And because of that, uh, you know, whenever a comparative literature syllabus was being devised in a university, that, I'm sorry, that syllabus uh, would be drawn by scholars from different departments, not just English department, not less uh, cultural. Scholars from different departments would draw the syllabus uh, of comparative literature. So this eclecticism, drawing sources, drawing from different sources, deriving ideas from different sources has led critics to argue that comparative literature is not well defined, that comparative literature is ill-defined, insufficiently defined, and that comparatists will fall, comparison, comparative studies will fall into dilettantism. Dilettantism. A dilettant is a person who uh, is interested in, who seems interested, but who is not very interested, who doesn't, who is very shallow. So comparative literature was accused of shallowness because of its interdisciplinary nature. The third reason for comparative literature's death, lack of a proper methodology and purpose. You know what happened? The methods and aims of comparative literature have neither been unanimously accepted nor been spelt out. The comparatists adopt various methods. Some of them find out similarities between works. Some of them find out differences between works. And some of them found out both similarities and differences. And there entered comparison. Is that comparative study? No. We have to, yes, we will find similarities and differences when we do comparison. But a comparatist should not have stopped there. He should have asked the questions why and how. Why are there such differences? Why are there such similarities? When you compare a, uh, a Malami 
uh, people as diverse as Malame with, say, Emily Dickinson, you will find a lot of uh, similarities. So you have to ask the question. Just finding the similarities is not sufficient. The comparatist has to ask the question, why? But this was not done by comparatists. So this lack of a proper methodology and purpose affected comparative literature. And my fourth point would be that comparative, the death of comparative literature was caused by the pressure exerted by vocational courses in the curriculum. I'm sure you will understand this vocational courses. You know, parents, students, all of us want job-oriented courses. And comparative literature is a job-oriented. There was nothing about job orientation as far as comparative literature is concerned. There was no uh, vocationality in comparative literature. And, you know, in, in, in literary in, in studies, comparative literature was squeezed on the... Uh, job-oriented courses and because of this again nobody was studying comparative literature the necessity for a more vocational approach where both students and their uh, parents were looking for job-oriented courses meant that comparative literature had to make way for those vocational courses so another reason for comparative literature for being ousted uh, from the academy. And finally, my fifth point would be comparative literature's death was caused by the emergence of modern literary theories. I explained part of that, but I want to point out one more thing. I want to speak about the, the impact of post-colonialism, very briefly. You know, one of the seminal texts of post-colonialism, uh, written by three people, Griffith, uh, Tiff Griffiths, Tiffin, and Ashcroft, The Empire Writes Back. What is the subtitle of that work? Theory and Practice in Post-Colonial Literatures. Now, let me ask you a question. Which discipline studies literatures? Comparative literature, right? And post-colonial studies, uh, you know, uh, this seminal text of post-colonialism is subtitled Theory and practice in post-colonial literatures mm, encroaching into the sphere of comparative literature. And in that book, uh, these authors, they say that the term post-colonial is most appropriate for the new cross-cultural criticism that has emerged in the recent years. The new cross-cultural criticism. So they defined post-colonialism as a cross-cultural criticism. Now, what is this cross-cultural criticism? Wasn't it the sphere of comparative literature? Well, a stronger contender came in the form of post-colonialism. And again, comparative literature surrendered. So these five things, I would say, contributed to the demise of comparative literature. And finally, I would like to take you through the last part. What is the specter? My, type, my, paper, my lecture is titled Specter of a Discipline. What is this spectral rebirth? What is, what ha in other words, I am trying to look at what happened in other parts of the world while comparative literature was uh, dying in the West. What happened in the West? versus what is happening in the rest of the world. You know what? The Western scholars of comparative literature, uh, they studied European literatures giving utmost importance to European values. They were very well aware of other literatures. They, were, they knew that there were other great literatures in the world outside the West. But because of their Eurocentric attitude, they never paid, maybe it was conscious, maybe it was unconscious, but they, they served Eurocentrism. The tastes and uh, 
the values of Europe was given up at most prominence by the Europeans. And one of their prominent motives in literary study, in comparative study, the, one of the major motives of Western scholars was to establish the supremacy of Western culture over other cultures. You know what? We know about African culture, Asian culture, the Middle Eastern culture, uh, literatures, African, Indian, uh, you know, Asian literature, East Middle Eastern literature. They were all studied, maybe. If at all they were studied, they were relegated to the rubric of area studies. They weren't even given the pride of place of literary studies. The literature from Asia, Africa, Latin America, Middle East, all these literatures were relegated to area studies, not literature studies. The European literatures were understood as the, as the you know, touchstone, as the great masterpieces of literature, as canonical, as aesthetic, and promoting universal values, while the texts from the Northwest, from other parts of the world, were read more from an ethnographic, historical, anthropological perspective than as works of literature. It was very bad of them, right? So I would like to draw your attention to the, just the title of a 2003 article uh, written by Ipshida Chanda. She, uh, her title is, can the non-Western comparatist speak? This is what I want to ask. Can the non-Western compa comparatist speak? The birth of the rebirth of comparative literature in the East, in other parts of the world, it happened because of this question. Com the non-Western comparatist started speaking. And the specter of comparative literature took rebirth. What happened? Ganesh Devi, G. N. Devi, he says, the idea is to challenge the unconscious colonial desires of the West. He says, the unconscious colonial desires of the West, what, what does that do? Which perpetuate a situation where no Indian critic is taken seriously in Western literary circles. Whatever the Indian critics say, not accepted because they are just area studies, uh, not worthy of any attention. This was the way the Eurocentric Western man considered the Indian critics, says Ganesh Devi and in 1998. Susan Bassnett uh, said something very interesting. She said, that the objective of comparative literary studies is to undermine and undo the tendency of dominant cultures to appropriate emergent ones. Think about it. Even as, so what was happening was, even as the death knell of comparative literature was ringing in the West, the opposite process was happening in the rest of the world. Comparative literature in Asia, in Latin America, the Caribbean, the Mediterranean, in all these places, comparative literature was gaining in strength and prominence. Comparative literature began to feature prominently in the syllabi of literary studies in the universities in all other parts of the world, except the US and the Europe. Comparative literature started expanding wherever it was explicitly linked with questions of national identity and culture. This is something we have to understand. You know, the original idea of comparative literature was as world comparative literature, as world literature, as against national literature. And the Western comparatist was always against the idea of national literature. They were speaking about world literature. They spoke about it, but they gave importance to European interests that we know. Anyway, so comparative literature expanded in all other parts of the world, not by focusing on world literature, but by focusing on national literatures. Okay, so 
the idea is not of universalism this is not universalism rather it focused on something that the western critics opposed vehemently always they were against this the specificity of national literatures you know what swapan majumdar the indian critic says it is because of this predilection for national literature that comparative literature has struck roots in the third world nations and in india in particular because of the special liking for national literature comparative literature has flourished in the third world countries and in the in countries like india this is what swapan majumdar says exact opposite of what the comparatives said earlier we should be against national literature they said comparative literature is against national literature for the west but in the east in india swapan majumdar says comparative literature take took roots in third world because it was rooted in the interest in national literature ganesh devi says something else he says he suggests that comparative literature in india is directly linked to the rise of modern indian nationalism the nationalist feeling in india he notes that comparative literature has been used to assert the na national cultural identity so comparative literature is used by the critics from other parts of the world not to assert any universal values not to assert the supremacy of european culture not to assert any world literature but to give importance to national cultural identity at time, once it seemed incompatible but the indian critics the eastern critics made it possible the shift in perspective is clearly evident earlier comparative literature started with western literature and looked outwards comparative literature the west would use comparative literature as a lens to look at the outside world now what is happening is the west is being scrutinized from without the west is being scrutinized from outside it's very interesting i will give you a few instances you will find it very interesting swapan majumdar goes to the extent of calling english french and german literatures as sub national literatures you know uh, ganesh devi had said that you know they didn't give any importance to indian critics swapan majumdar went on to call those critics the german the french and english literatures as sub national literatures not even national literature think of the courage the boldness uh, with which the eastern comparatists uh, were speaking in africa you know uh, the african writers led by wal soinka questioned hegel's notion and negation of africa from history and civilization i'm not sure if uh, you are familiar with this idea but hegel wrote a book in 1899 frederick hegel titled the philosophy of history and he spoke about four major cultures and civilizations of the world curiously he excluded african culture he he didn't consider africa as a african culture as a culture or a civilization hegel argued that africa was unhistorical that it did not have a history that it was weak undeveloped that it was devoid of morality values religion politics in effect Hegel was telling the Africans you have no culture you have no history how painful it would have been for the african to listen to this he denied africa a history and culture hegel is important not because his ideas are correct but because he represents the perception of a white european intellectual about africa the african writers pointed out that there were two africas one created by the eurocentric lens of the west and the other the real africa if we can call it real or the one invented and imagined as the other 
by the West and the second, the real one that survives regardless of the misconceptions and denigrations of the West. So two Africas. Wal Soinka won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1986. You know, he was the first black African to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. And he titled his Nobel Prize lecture like this. This past must address its present. This past, this past, the past created by Hegel and the other Europeans must address its present, must rectify the wrongs that you have committed towards us. Hegel, you know, in that speech, in that Nobel Prize speech, uh, Wal Soinga singled out Hegel for special treatment. He, he demolished the arguments of Hegel in the Nobel Prize speech. You know what? Also worth remembering, you know, would be uh, Tinua Achibi, another Nigerian writer, he, he, he eloquently criticizes the racism in Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. I'm not going into that. Uh, you know, the, the title of that essay is An Image of Africa, Racism in Conrad's Heart of Darkness. What is happening? The West is being scrutinized by the rest. The Indian, the African, the Caribbean, the Latin American, all these critics were scrutinizing the West from outside. And then th there was Edward Said with his concept of Orientalism, rewriting the contours of literary and post-colonial theory in the late 20th century. So he was speaking about the other Right, you remember the other. The other is everything that lies outside of the self. Uh, and Said said in a publication in 1978 publication, Hegel said, "The self is the familiar, familiar that is familiar to us, the European, the West, the us, and the other is strange, the Orient, the East, them." So we, I am self i am good i am the west i am the europe and you the other you are strange you are the east you are uh, them okay othering something very interesting you know what the concept of self and other as a counterpart of it i told you earlier was propounded by Hegel himself, who said that Africa did not have a culture. So he propounded this idea of the self and the other. And Wal Soinka in his speech, in his Nobel Prize speech, uh, spoke about the West's conception of Africa as the super other. Africa as, was conceived as the super other by the West, said also in the, so he was using the same terms used by whom uh, used by Hegel to criticize Hegel. You know, as Caliban would say, uh, you taught me language and my profit on it is I know how to curse. So Inca criticized and demolished Hegel by using Hegel's own words. The super other. Jean Longsi in his essay, The Myth of the Other. China in the eyes of the West spoke about the West's conception of China as the ultimate other. So Inka spoke about the West's conception of Africa as the super other and Longxi speaks about the West's conception of China as the ultimate other. This then is the post-colonial avatar of comparative literature in the rest of the world. Here, Comparative literature is used in a wonderfully constructive manner to explore indigenous traditions, to criticize imposed and imagined and imported traditions, and ultimately, this post-colonial comparative literature from the rest of the world clamors for the reconstituting of the literary canon.
they are saying you have filled the canon the canon with your writers european writers open the canon for our writers because we too belong we are not the other we too belong the focus is well and and here the idea is comparative literature has changed completely once it was